This particular drawing is the guy on the left hand side. Let's move the cursor and see what I'm talking about. This one right here. He is the punch. And uh, as time went by, we'll get to that uh, picture in a minute. But, uh, there was a, uh, an imitation made in Canada of a punch in the face. <laughs> the paper copy will be available in June, which will be a lot less expensive than the current hardcover copy. Uh, a young man uh, named John Henry Walker stole the punch idea and landed this magazine, and the uh, library and archive program here has a complete collection of punch in Canada on paper. You can imagine how much, when I put my hands on that for the first time, the, the, the thrilling feeling I was touching a piece of Canadian history that old and uh, that delicate. Uh, I only had to go outside the university here uh, to collect the number of cartoons I wanted, and the only one I couldn't get was available on film uh, at the National Library called the Pedicay. So there you go. We've got a really great collection. Uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Blackmore, and I uh, have succeeded in getting a That's, that's a long story. We can talk about that coffee break <laughs> for something similar to it. Okay. Uh, this is Punch of Charlie. Okay. Uh, yes, indeed. I don't know who this might be. The, the picture is not quite as clean as I like it. I took it off my control with the uh, camera. But it deals with Harper's Weekly. And Harper's Weekly in the U.S. was the big uh, source 
of editorial cartoons during the time period. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, and here you're seeing Santa Claus. I'll tell you why. This was a very early Canadian cartoon called The Sprite. Uh, it was published in 1865 in a magazine at the barracks, the British barracks in Quebec City. Uh, and here you have uh, John Bull with the uh, pork pie hat uh, talking to these young uh, immigrants who are coming to Canada. Uh, they're saying, beware of that horrible, horrible USA. If they will yankify everything exactly the term he used to the Yankee <laughs> I'm going to give you some theme cards. Okay, up to the uh, up to the modern age. This is a Brian Gable take on two different things. Uh, the cartooning in the modern age is considerably different than the cartooning of ages gone by. Uh, and here you have Gable. Uh, the top one, of course, is, plays on that familiar thing uh, you see at every McDonald's. You know, here's George, employee of the month. Whoever the employee of the month may be. So the employee of the month here, of course, is causing all kinds of uh, terrible, terrible things. Catastrophes, snowstorms, windstorms, locusts. That you remember probably of the uh, pages of the Old Testament. But the bottom one, I think, is the one that plays so beautifully on two different themes. And this is Muammar Gaddafi escaping from Libya before they catch him. Uh, and if you may remember, Gaddafi had this army that went with him everywhere of 18-year-old girls. And there they are. And you can see them loud and clear. Gable picks up on this particular thing. Uh, also, uh, Gaddafi was a bit of a bizarre critter, to put it mildly. And, uh, on this particular cartoon, Gable plays backwards on it by saying, uh, just ignore me. As you can see by the looks of the uniform of the girls, you're not going to ignore this guy no matter what. <laughs> anyway, continuing right along in our story. Uh, the uh, magazine I mentioned, Punch in Canada, a uh, short term of three, uh, three uh, years. Uh, however, it uh, did end up spawning the birth of others such as the Sprite, which you saw. Uh, Punch in Canada that also inspired other magazines like Grim Chuckle, that's sometimes called Grim Chuckle. Uh, others uh, such as Diogenes was a major publication during the time period. But it was in uh, 1869 that the major transition took place. Anybody here from Montreal? Originally, oh, Montreal became the uh, comic illustrated press of the late Victorian period. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1869, the David Ray Publishing Company of Montreal uh, cited the Canadian Illustrated News' first edition, volume one, number one, in December of that year. In uh, January, February of the uh, following year, uh, another publication, the Opinion Publique, the uh, French language version of this thing, uh, also appeared. These were 11 by 17 broadsheets. You can imagine how big they were. Mercifully, the archives here again has a complete paper collection of the Canadian Illustrated <coughs> which someone thankfully thought to find. Anyway, uh, 11 by 17, this is quite large. The Canadian Illustrated News and Opinion Public did not start out to be <coughs> opinion papers. They were travel logs. If you go back and look at any of them, you'll just see this. Visit the Trent Canal in Peterborough, Ontario. Many, many pictures of the Trent Canal from Peterborough, Ontario. I also had New York, a glittering jewel in art and entertainment. And then slowly but surely, and piece by piece, the David A. Printing Company, ended up adding cartoons. And the cartoons they added were on the first page of each issue. They were a weekly, I should have mentioned that, by the way. They had some rather interesting characters show up. Uh, there was a Frenchman named Edward Jump uh, who came to Montreal. Uh, he had married a French opera singer. Uh, and I guess she wasn't too happy in Washington to see where he lived. Uh, so uh, they went up to Montreal. He had quite a resume. Edward did. 
He was a French man. Uh, he was a gifted artist, but he made his living drawing labels for whiskey bottles. <laughs> uh, he was also, uh, he got, he landed on a sort of a lucky streak at one particular point, uh, and that lucky streak included San Francisco, California. And uh, San Francisco was, I guess most of you would know, uh, has quite a collection uh, history of earthquakes. And as one earthquake was leveling the city uh, back in the 1870s, uh, Edward Jump was out on the plaza with his easel painting a picture of the whole city going down the tubes. Uh, the painting was called Earthquakey Times and is still available in uh, California. You can actually see it as, as it were. Anyway, moving right along, I'm going to lose my spot here. In uh, 1873, uh, the Dividend Publishing Company decided to uh, expand its horizons, so to speak. And the horizons that expanded were in New York City. Uh, it proved to be an artistic success and a financial failure, uh, which was nothing uncommon with the press during that time period. Anybody who entered Quebec City, or sorry, New York City, had to compete with the Frank Leslie Empire. And the Frank Leslie Empire uh, was the home of all kinds of illustrated magazines. And they had them for women, they had them for uh, laborers, they had them for intellectuals, etc., etc., etc. Now, the paper, the New York Daily Graphic, took off in the last 10 years, but unfortunately, the Inverary Publishing Company did not. All right, we're going to just move a little bit on this one here. Ah, get out there. <coughs> gentleman is Henri Julien. Uh, he is the first cartoonist to be employed full-time by a newspaper in Canada. Uh, in spite of his name, Henri Julien, he worked primarily in the uh, English language field. Uh, he uh, had an extremely interesting history uh, and he has a legacy which uh, is interesting in itself. Uh, there is a street in Montreal named Boulevard Henri Julien. And uh, one of my friends in Vancouver and I were in Montreal in February, not a recommended time period for <laughs> Montreal. Uh, we were doing an evaluation of the journalism program at the Concordia. And we had a free afternoon, and Stephen said, I, I'm not walking anywhere. Uh, we, we had a, a hotel room on the north side of Sherbrooke Street, and the restaurant was on the south side. And we ordered room service. That's how cold it was. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we were on this bus tooting around Montreal, and my wife's favorite activity in places she's never been. And I'm sitting there looking, look up, my God, Avenue Henri Julien. And there it was, someone recognized this fellow as he should be. The other side of the coin, however, was the sad one, uh, because Henri Julien uh, was, his character was picked up by the FLQ. If you mean him the walking, uh, the walking peasant, well, that had been drawn by Palmer Julian. He, of course, did not know him the FLQ, thank God for that, I'm sure he would probably be happy. Uh, he, he died suddenly and very tragically. Uh, he was walking out across from Windsor Station about to Montreal when he said, oh my God, I don't feel well, and he died before he came around. And uh, he, uh, he worked primarily for the Montreal Star. So let's go down and we'll continue on a bit more of the world of Henri Julien. Uh, this is uh, Jean Benoît de Pépin. Uh, Alan X were very, very famous at that particular time period. Although this is not a particularly uh, politically driven thing, I thought looking just at the art and the way the art was structured uh, was interesting in itself. And this thing would come out every year, and uh, Ontario had its version as well. And then people would rush to the bookstores and the newsstands to get them because they had predictions of what was going to happen during the next year. So there you could look up and say, oh my god, I'm not going to make it past me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, it really cemented, uh, and I can say this just my own observations, uh, the style 
who only Juliet used. As you can see, it's a live drawing. It's very, very uh, intense. Uh, if you just look at the young woman's dress and look at what he's done in Dawson, so it looks like it's a form type of pattern. Back at that time period, the way the, the, uh, the publishing worked, you either went with a lithograph, which was a carving based on stone in Greece, which was not much fun, uh, or you could go into wood carving and engraving. This is largely what they did. Uh, so Julien would uh, draw uh, his picture on, on paper. He would give it to an engraver, who would engrave it in reverse, in negative, uh, and uh, put it into to a metal container, and then use it as a flat plate for publishing the books, for publishing magazines. And it took a lot of work to get there. Uh, the technology ended up uh, being a technology that really, in essence, defeated uh, the whole industry. Because by the time 1893, 94 rolls around, two significant things have happened. There had been a uh, photograph of the Montreal Customs House, but more important, uh, there were photographs in the Toronto Globe of the empty office of Sir John A. Macdonald shortly after he died. And the newspapers were then getting interested in uh, illustration, illustrated journalism, and making it rough and tough and mean uh, on guys who write just illustrated presses. Uh, this was uh, one of the uh, magazines that uh, Julian drew for. Uh, there were some good stories in this one. Uh, I chose to uh, keep the French uh, limited, uh, primarily because it's going for an English market. Uh, but he's, he wrote for both, as I mentioned to you earlier. So the duck, that's the name of this particular one. There are many French language chunks in this book uh, that I did, but nothing expansive in the text, as you will see. So it is the most <coughs> Okay, La Chasse Galerie. Any, any of you familiar with this story? I didn't think you would be. It was kind of interesting because my younger daughter, uh, who was at Central uh, Secondary School here for a while, came home and said, Dad, they're talking about something you know something about. <laughs> I said, Are you sure? <laughs> and they had taken. Uh, class and discuss French Canadian folklore and this story comes up in it. I'm talking about strange coincidences. The same week, Michael Enright on CBC did a story on La Chasse Galerie. Now, here it is, it's the sacred canoe. And it's part of the Francophone folklore. <coughs> These guys in the boat during the canoe are les boucherons, lumberjacks. And they're up in the woods chopping down trees. And it's getting closer and closer to the holiday season. And they want to go home to their wives and their girlfriends. Difficult. But they made a pact with God. And God turned the canoe into a spirited canoe. And there were conditions. Number one, thou shalt not go within 100 meters of a church steeple with malintent. Number two, no booze. Mm -hmm. Now, you start thinking about that. These guys have been up in the woods for a long time. They're told, no, thou cannot <laughs> have a glass of wine. But there they are. They're celebrating. They're having a merry old time. Uh, Andre <coughs> Julien, by the way, did the art of this. I should have mentioned that to you. Uh, there they are with their wives and their girlfriends. And they're having a great time. So what could go wrong? Well, it went wrong. Right? <laughs> Because one of the characters uh, involved in this particular story had snuck what we would call a picky of whiskey into the canoe. <laughs> and when they got within 100 yards of the church steeple, the eyes of the church steeple spotted the blues and removed the smell. And there they are, falling out of the canoe. <laughs> now this little story not only appeared in the French language that I now, uh, it also was translated and published in Century magazines in New York City. So our friend Julian is starting to get a, uh, shall we say, a good uh, bit of publicity. The Far Sword, uh, again, Julian drawing. Uh, this is a comic magazine. The Far Sword being the joke. Uh, and uh, it was founded along with uh, another one, an English language version, 
uh, back in uh, 1876, tried to convince <coughs> Canadians uh, to sign a, a trade treaty with the United States. Of course, as we all know how that worked out, it wasn't very good. Here, look at the detail. This is part of Julian's life I found fascinating. Because it starts to govern things that he does. Uh, he's now out in Western Canada. Uh, this is a view of Devil's Creek, as it's called. Why was he in Western Canada? Well, uh, there are some characters out there named Louis Hudiel and some of those folks. Uh, there were other people who were taking advantage of market capitalism and shipping in about as much liquor as you could possibly consume in his lifetime. Uh, and it was leading to problems. So the government uh, decided that they were going to uh, take charge of this mess and do something about it. The uh, fellow in charge of the whole story uh, was invited to talk to journalists about painting a privileged picture of activity in Western Canada. And they did. And Jean-Henri Julien was selected to be the journalist. So he gets on a train in Montreal, he goes to Toronto, waits there for two days, and uh, then uh, gets on a, uh, a train as far as it would go, which was far to the north of Dakota at the time. And then they took uh, horses and wagons into, uh, into Winnipeg. Uh, during this time period, he sketched all these stories, which I found fascinating, and it's online. You can just access it uh, all originally as view of Western Canada. Uh, this is uh, the, the peasant. Uh, this is your arch typical, uh, what I call the francophone of the time period. Uh, you can see the duke, a uh, long, uh, elongated coat that he wears. Uh, and the uh, shoes, uh, which of course were, were designed to uh, work in nasty, nasty weather. Again, I thought these would look good, even though not all, all the people are right, they are cartoons. Another uh, Julien's uh, magazine that he wrote for, the old industry. The illustrations are quite good. I couldn't record them before she had too many of them. All right. <coughs> We're going to go down to Julien now as, a, uh, as an artist on this paper. Uh, this particular uh, drawing is of a great tragedy in Montreal during the time period. Uh, it's the leveling of the Molson's Brewery, which made Montreal a de facto dry city for quite some time. Uh, something that you would not, not exactly want. What's interesting about it is how it, it sort of lays the beginnings of the comic strip. And you can see it's got four different panels on it. And you've seen the stuff I've done so far, we have not had that much in terms of these paneling. It's usually one single page. Now we're getting four and one. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, his trip uh, to, to the West. Uh, this is a harvest, a wheat harvest. This is one that blew my mind. Empire uh, the Canadian marching song. This was to convert all those persons who liked Americans into those persons who did not like Americans. And uh, it was commissioned uh, by uh, Devere. And uh, Henri Julien actually did the drawing on Devere did the version. There was, there was more on this. Uh, uh, here is uh, Henri Julien, front row center. Uh, with the uh, <coughs> appointment to the press gallery in Ottawa. Uh, he covered Ottawa for a fairly long period of time. And that's where he got some of his crazy ideas, some of it too. Oh, yes indeed. <coughs> this one, uh, again, drawn by Julien. Yet one more uh, play with the local culture. What you have here is infidelity. Uh, well, the infidelity doesn't take place in this particular frame, but it takes place after. The infidelity comes to the attention of the local authorities who immediately call a trial. And the man on the left-hand side uh, is eventually, uh, eventually dies of 
factual forces. But the other one on this side over here, the infidel, is sentenced to hang in this cage until totally decomposed off a pot, off a pole across the uh, river at Lady Quebec. Yes, rather gruesome, isn't it? Uh, there are some other gruesome ones as well, but that was one I found. I had, uh, this was not, it did not come to me apparently. Uh, I had to really hunt to find out what this was all about. And that was one of the fun things of researching in cartoons, is you never knew what's going to find. Uh, Laurier, uh, as drawn by uh, Henri Julien, catch the, uh, catch what is going on here. Uh, this is a play on the toy. See the hand? <laughs> See the cap? <coughs> well, we'll start with the haircut. But there he is. This is very, very, very politicized. But like all editorial cartoons, you have to really know what's behind them. What's the inspiration? Who did this? Oh my God, the, I keep going back to my book, but I don't know. Uh, it has 140 cartoons in it. And each one required a special look as to what they really think. This is something you've never seen today, and for obvious reasons. Uh, these two guys uh, uh, are both uh, politicians. Um, they both went to Washington uh, to try to muster a trade deal with the Americans. Strangely enough, in America, like I did uh, in the USA, no one even mentioned this. I thought for sure once it was published, there would be some reaction nor with the book as well. So you can look at these things historically and say this is what happened, and try and understand why it would happen, and this is exactly what did happen here. All right, we'll go back to Julien as a cartoon. This is the Canadian Illustrated Village. Very nice piece. Uh, it's a tariff fight uh, that's happened along the, uh, the Chambly uh, River and Canal system uh, near Vichy, Quebec. And there's a lot of traffic going up and down the river in the Lake Black Central and places of that particular nature. And uh, the Canadians put a tariff on the transactions. The Americans were really checked that they retaliated. This is what the cartoon Now, the character, as you can see, uh, the Canadian character, uh, is looking with great disdain at his American counterpart. The American is bent over, and the stars and stripes are not coordinated like they would be in an ordinary country. Interesting. There's an insult paid in there. It's really easy. Oh, we're back to this here. There, no, there were two different ones. <coughs> this is one of my favorites. This is uh, Sir Sanford Fleming and Alexander Mackenzie. Sir Sanford Fleming and Alexander Mackenzie did not see the building of the CPR in any way, shape, or form as the same thing. Uh, of course, Sir Sanford Fleming was encouraging the adoption of his time zone technology. And these two guys are fighting it out over where will the CP railway go. And why is McDonald not in this? Well, this was drawn at the time period uh, when McDonald was out of power thanks to the Pacific scandal. So you have Mackenzie in the driver's seat. We all know what happened in 1878. Mackenzie uh, lost the election. And Sir John Hay, speaking of guys who like to drink, uh, mm -hmm. back with power and authority. Uh, this, uh, this one here is a pro-immigration uh, field. I love the way that Canada is portrayed in all of these. I mean, th th there's a love and affection by Juliet for his country, you can tell. In this particular case here, you have these uh, people with their only worldly possessions. The one little boy on the bottom here. Everything they own, they can carry. And who's on the right-hand side? Miss Canada. But she's a special Miss Canada. She's young. And she's definitely virgin. All the white clothing. So, it's the welcoming idea. A different point of editorial cartoon. This is one of my favorites. This is the... Uh, uh, opposite to Lefar Sir. This is the English version, it's the Joker it's called. <laughs> and uh, here you have McDonald. He's boarding up the border. <laughs> and 
And look who's behind him there, just watching every moment, eh? <laughs> Good old Uncle Sam. <laughs> the Uncle Sam cartoons I ran across, I just wish I could spend a whole morning with you showing you all of them, because they are fantastic. <laughs> so here you have McDonald's. And you can see some of the things that he's you know, basically campaigning against. A rape on his right knee can fall through to the edge of the drawing and see cotton. Not over here, flour, uh, cheese, but maybe dairy products. There had been a, uh, what was called a customs union, a trade union, uh, from 1852 to 1865 uh, between Britain and the uh, United States, but then that got canceled. It wasn't renewed until more early did it. <clears throat> the national policy, of course, is the famous legislation uh, by McDonald uh, to uh, keep the Americans out of the Canadian market. Why a race? Well, the liberals at that particular point weren't exactly weak. Uh, there were independent members uh, of Parliament, there was the Senate to deal with. So there was no guarantee that uh, this kind of thing would uh, end up uh, being uh, enacted in any way, shape, or form. And on top of it, the Americans still had a game to play. So he is pictured as a horse race. And the guy out in front of the horse race is Edward Blake, leader of the Liberal Party. <coughs> These were, th this is the only cartoon I found on this topic. Uh, it's Republicanism, and it uh, goes back to a time period when we were arguing about nationhood, and a bunch of people wanted to make sure that we became a republic. The tariff. We still talk about this stuff. There's a battle going on here, so whether the national tariff should be, one, revenue producing, or two, protectionist. Assuming that you can't use either one together. So Cartwright and uh, Tupper are arguing it out there. <coughs> I still find it amazing the technology. These were a lot of these were photographed by me with a digital camera off a uh, microfilm, and they, they they came out very well. Well, here's Uncle Sam again. Always, always take a look at Uncle Sam and how he is dressed and how he is behaving. So here's the poor little Francophone kid clearing the land for his future farm, and this reprobate is trying to get him to do something different. He's bent over, long and skinny, that was separate. Look at his hat as well, and the beard. This is not a guy you would bite off for good. The teapots. This comes from an opinion from me. Uh, it again deals with tariffs. And there's this really big battle going on as to who's going to get the ball at the hardest when McDonald's lays the tariff line on people. Will it be tea? Coffee? Whatever. Again, a very good Julian. Again, the detail that he drew, it just blows my mind. You just don't see it today. Uh, Al Jazeera, last week, the International News Network had a whole hour of editorial cartoon. I sell it. The lead, uh, the lead cartoonist was Sidney Wilkinson, who uh, is the editorial cartoonist for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, again, <coughs> lots of tariffs. This is George Brown, founder of the Globe. Uh, he's a tinker. And uh, here's this uh, young woman who has brought her pots and pans to be repaired by him, and he was telling her that because of the tariff wall, you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. A little hard to see, but <clears throat> Vidiana, again, who's going to win this battle? Again, just look at Uncle Sam. All you need to do is get a little bit larger here. And uh, you can see, at uh, the very top of it, it's not all in there, but you can see clouds of smoke. Uh, smoking uh, at that particular time in public was also just as bad as drinking in public. 
or any other but number of crazy and nasty things. So if you started smoking outside or whittling, uh, the catch, uh, Uncle Sam whittling uh, occurring every so often in these things. And we're back on where we're shooting at now. If I can find you. The biggest issue that I discovered during this time period, and unfortunately I had time to show all of it to you, you know, was the annexation issue. One of those little things of Canadian history that sort of shoved aside, and we haven't really dealt with it to any great degree since. It starts in 1849, the same year that John Henry Walker launched Punch in Canada. So there, there's a coincidence there. The battle was what would be appropriate for a new nation. And of course, you see with the Republican cartoon earlier, there, there was not a whole lot of uh, distinction there, but enough to make it worthwhile to talk about. I'm losing it here, I think. Oh, that's okay. uh, all the way through these magazines, you see this constant struggle. The options were annexation to the USA. And believe it or not, there were places in the U.S. which would have welcomed us with open arms. I discovered on the CIHM print a piece of legislation in Vermont outlining the conditions whereby Canada could join the USA. And some of Walt Whitman's poetry, I found reference to the fact that he really believed that uh, Americans should go out and, and capture these poor Canadians and bring them home to the sanctuary of the USA. And he was a reporter for the Brooklyn Eagle in that took place. That, that was one big the annexation issue. And it created, like Quebec uh, separatism, a lot of hostilities. And you see a lot of hostilities. Right now, what you've got on the screen uh, is a cartoon by John Henry Walker. This is 1849. Uh, again, that was photographed directly on paper. Uh, you can see the American Eagle in the top left hand corner, uh, a rather nasty, uh, vicious little birdie. And then all of the options. There they are, right? We well, can't see my fingers, can we? Huh? This one here. Choice of independence. We have a country in New York, which of course is just now. Colonial dependency was something that was discussed in great seriousness. Uh, Edward Blake, again, leader of the Liberal Party, an old boy from London, Ontario, back to Um advocated imperial union. So someone mentioned to him, do you know how big India is? And there was this blank, he thought, yeah, okay, no more of that talk. Uh, okay, annexation is the talk here. And down here in the left-hand corner, if ever you get into cartoon, you look for this little guy. He's John Henry Walker's walking man. And he's also a takeoff lady of the views called Diana. Interesting stuff. Now, what you're going to find here, John Wilson Bengoff, who becomes the great Toronto cartoonist, decides to cartoon. He actually steals this idea of the cartoon of his own. I don't know if we get that far enough. We'll see I should mention there it is. Same issue. And you see on the top of the poll, you have uh, public opinion. And you have the major political leaders of the time period looking up at it. There's Blake, there's Brown, McDonald. And there's Bengoff's signature right there. Bengoff. Uh, was an interesting study in himself. Uh, he founded a magazine called Grip that lasted 20 years. Uh, he was also a temperance freak. I mean, literally, he was. Uh, he wrote this little magazine called the Gin Mill Primer, uh, which basically told you if you drank alcohol somewhere along the line, your brain would wither away. I suspect that could happen if <laughs> you drank enough of it, but it's certainly not. There's no, nothing called temperance during the time. Anyway, uh, he, uh, for those of you who came from Toronto, he was a mausoleum right at uh, the 401 and uh, Young Street, just off the side. And uh, 
he is in there. That is his last resting place. He did a thing uh, after he got out of the church called chalk talking. And he would go on tour doing lectures, much the same time he did today. And he'd draw at the same time as he did the lectures. And he uh, Lynn Johnson, uh, for better or for worse, did the same thing very well. So uh, anyway, we've got uh, Betty Goff introduced to the stream. Uh, this I found in the Montreal Star. This is kind of amazing. <coughs> it looked like, uh, what would Canada look like after annexation? Except, look at the size of Cleveland. <laughs> Nevada. What's this big? Labrador. Saskatchewan. They're really going to be cheated on this one. Rupert's land. And all these little teeny weeny places. And Greenland and Iceland. I could not resist putting this in. I don't know who drew it, but it was very good. This is a Grin Shuffle piece. Uh, again, John Henry Walker, received on the way left hand side. This cartoon has a sense of viciousness about it. And if you look at uh, this, the damsel in distress here, on the uh, left hand side, right there, uh, she's holding cat and nine tails which was the weapon of choice by sea captains to do in bad crew, or the fitting crew. And uh, it says, the last dream of a disappointed politician. In these words, Confederation is here, it's 1869. <coughs> Poor country right there is, is succumbing to all this pressure, but they're going to conserve it. That's what the sign says. In some cases, uh, I have to redo all the writing on these things because the, uh, the original ones just weren't good. The drawings are fine, they don't work. Uh, this is the one of the Acadians. Uh, anyway, which way are you going to go? Uh, what I loved about this particular was how times never change. Look at the big bad guys that already come from. Wall Street. And then on the right hand side, you see the repudiation gold ring. This was a, a campaign to bring the gold standard back as the uh, thing upon which the gold was based. Anyway, you've got all these people all fighting against it's, it's the crossroads, it's the, the annexation issue. I wonder why. Oh, here, I love this one. Three balls above the door, says Uncle Sam. This guy is running a pawn shop. And what are these little kids pawning off? The Union Jack. <laughs> yep. Little Ben Holmes uh, is this guy right here. He was an MP. Uh, another walker. This was aimed at the French market. Uh, and let's see if I have three things there. He's essentially a uh, telling the French Canadians that if they uh, allow uh, annexation of any particular type, the laws, the language, the culture would be like that. Uh, we all know that's a popular theme still. Well, here's Miss Canada. And she is telling guess who about the railway. Not This was not the, uh, the CP at this particular point. They were talking about the but again, uh, she's telling him that this is the only step number one uh, to get this thing. Again, look at her dress, look at her face, look at her posture, all the neat things that she stands. Uh, Arthur Racing. <coughs> to me, this is one of the best cartoons on the application uh, Arthur Racy succeeded Henri Julien at the uh, Montreal Star as their cartoonist. He was born and brought up in Quebec. He uh, spoke French and English <coughs> something. And uh, I got a phone call from one of the archivists there about six months ago saying, we should have the entire racy collection available for you for our another project. Okay. All right, George Brown. <coughs> George Brown was an interesting guy. George Brown was bumped off by one of his employees, which happens once in a while. 
Uh, Edward Blake, that I mentioned a little bit earlier, had been uh, involved uh, in the uh, Imperial Union complex. Uh, it wasn't going over all that well. And you can see it was here. It was Alexander Mackenzie, Edward Blake, and this guy, Goldwyn Smith. Goldwyn Smith uh, set a standard for most husbands. He married wealth. <laughs> he came from, uh, from England, took an appointment at Utica at uh, Cornell University. I don't think he got tenure because he was gone three years later. Uh, and he started making speeches. In 1875, he went on the lecture circuit and he made speeches on nationalism, Canadianism. Uh, in 1875, he published a newspaper called The National which is very much pro-Canadian. In uh, 1891, he published a book called Canada and the Canadian Question, in which he uh, basically said, get rid of this stupid country, give it to the Americans, they might do something good. So it was a complete turn of events. But he lived in a place in Toronto, which is still standing, called the Grange. You may even know where it is. It's behind the Art Gallery of Ontario. And that was the home of Golden Smith. And in my travels, I was lucky enough to find a whole collection of Goldman Smith speeches in his handwriting. So it would become part of my retinue. I love this one too. This was uh, Andre Alphonse Ryan, French Canadian. You couldn't find too much on him, um, but he's looking at uh, 10 years' growth from 1894 to 1904. And essentially, uh, it's my you see Baptiste Terrien, which is a union of his own. Over here, you've got uh, the English language version of it. Easy words, they're sticking it to Uncle Sam, saying, hey, this is an argument on paper. This one took more research than most of the rest of my collection. Chandler is a politician from Michigan. When Canada became a country, poor old Chandler had a fit. He could not see why we needed two countries in the northern half of the continent. So he set out to do something about it. Well, his first attack uh, was to end up raising a militia, which he succeeded in doing. And the militia was bound to uh, invade Canada kick out of anything vestige of Britishism, and join the USA. Mercifully, he never got it corrupt to doing that. Uh, this is Miss Kennedy in the chair. As you can see, he is in the busted, busted, busted over here. No one's. The fun of it was to find out who he was. And I came across this in, uh, yeah, in China. And I thought, huh, oh, this is interesting. Who is this guy? It took a lot of work, but I ended up in the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress in the United States has put profiles of all individuals who have ever sat in the Senate and the House of Representatives. So I started tracing them one by one by one. And lo and behold, I find Chandler. <coughs> lo and behold, I find a bibliographic reference to Chandler by a nun in Flint. And that's how I found it. This guy. I'm not in the All right, we're close. We're getting close to time here. Today's um, so annexation, and then we. Oh, Colonel Dennison. This came from the 1880s version of uh, Saturday Night Magazine. Same thing, anti annexationist. If you could read it, all the writing uh, to the right of the blades uh, are uh, names of states that had previously been independent. Colonel Dennison on the horse, doing the Don Quixote thing, uh, was the chief of police in Toronto at the time. He probably knew Murdoch. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. He was so pro-British, he bled red and white and blue. <laughs> and he used to break up parades uh, on the weekends if they weren't parades by orange and people like that. Oh, he was a real sweetie. <laughs> I like this one too. This uh, again comes from uh, Walker. It's uh, 
sign of the times is the annexation of dragon being slain. Again, really, the artwork's fantastic. There's a young woman going into uh, Uncle Sam's store, and she wants to buy something. He's making uh, a pitch to take her to dinner and other things. And uh, she's saying, sorry, and no do. You're not my kind. Uh, again, the out of the Zilverine here refers to a free trade agreement in uh, in Europe uh, that turns out badly. And you see uh, the fish merchant here saying annexation is a no. And here's the Zilverine pushing it away. It's pushing, pushing. This one is probably going to go on the front cover of the uh, the edition, the paper edition. And again, it's the same plea, it's the annexation plea. Come and take me. Sorry, I, I know I had to get to this one here. Uh, this is the uh, Lucetta Cake. It was uh, drawn in a magazine founded by a Frenchman who liked Americans. So he came over in 1863 to fight in the Civil War. And he didn't get a chance, the war ended. So he founds this paper in Montreal uh, and devoted to the of the cause of annexation. He was a pro-annexationist. And you can see here the annexation is still up here. Uh, the confederation is still up here. And then you got these two turkeys wandering around, totally oblivious to what's going to happen to them. Because there's been uh, that self-explanatory, handing over the baby. I did a lot of that. Mullet, uh, Colonel Benison again, cutting off the head of the annexations. And we're back to where we started. But you know what? It's 10 30. I'm supposed to be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> Tempting us with this. <laughs>